Hi, everyone. I'm Vijay Vaidiswaran, Global Energy and Climate Innovation Editor at The Economist and host of The Economist podcast, To a Lesser Degree. Welcome to Infodemic, Defending Democracy Against Disinformation. This special live stream is part of G Zero Media's Global Stage series, produced in partnership with Microsoft. From fake reports online that can impact elections in the US and around the world, to falsehoods about vaccine safety, our digital landscape is becoming increasingly more treacherous. Who's to blame and what should be done about it? That's what we're going to talk about over the next hour with some of the world's top experts in tech. To kick us off, I'm joined by Ginny Bedanes, Director of Strategic Projects, Cybersecurity and Democracy at Microsoft, and Kevin Allison, a Director of Eurasia Group's Geotechnology Practice. Welcome to you both. Hello. Thank you. Ginny. Let me start with you, Jenny. Let's start by defining this uh, curious word, infodemic, surely a, a sign of our times. What is it really that we're talking about? Sure. So infodemic essentially refers to the speed and scale at which information spreads, usually about a given topic. Um, and it gets mixed together with fact, fiction, rumor, intentionally placed lies. And what the result is, is consumers of that information are left with really no understanding of what is true. Um, it, when you think of the speed that it spreads and the scale that it can sped and spread in this day and age, then you're really faced with what is, was akin to a disease that has spread across our, our globe. Now, when I think of cybersecurity, solar winds and ransomware come to mind. Uh, to what extent is false information also a security threat? Yeah, they're they're very akin to one another. Um, in part, you know, it's even more acute when you consider the actors who are often behind this. So when you're talking about a nation state actor whose goals and objectives are typically to sow chaos and create divisions, um, whether they use the tools of a cybersecurity or a cyber attack, or if they use the tools of a disinformation campaign, um, ultimately those are similar objectives. Uh, but especially when you think of ransomware, one of the rising concerns is impact a real world offline impact of ransomware attacks. And that is where disinformation is also really problematic. You don't have to look too far. You don't have to look past vaccine hesitancy or the events of January 6th to acknowledge that disinformation is leading to real world offline harm, similar to what we're seeing with cyber attacks. Now, Kevin, your bread and butter at Eurasia Group is defining and assessing global risks. Is disinformation really a geopolitical risk? Absolutely. And I think Ginny got us off to a great start talking about some of the aspects of, of disinformation, the infodemic that, that makes it different. The, the fact that she referenced the velocity, the, the way that it can spread. Uh, I think there's a few other elements here that are important. There's an economy behind it. So modern technology has created the ability to, to make money off of spreading disinformation. Uh, that means you have a lot of actors who are interested in disinformation for both political and financial reasons. And, and that nexus is leading to, to geopolitical disruption. I think you can break it down in terms of a few different actors. You have uh, the most high profile cases are governments that are investing in disinformation operations for foreign influence. And, and that's what really tends to capture the headlines. But you also have many other uh, governments that are using it for internal purposes to discredit the, their political opposition to uh, deflect from controversy or, or poor economic performance. Uh, so I think you have both a kind of internal political dimension to disinformation and a risk that it creates there, uh, including potentially keeping certain governments that are that are not meeting the needs of their citizens, giving them another tool to stay in power. And then you have the foreign policy dimension, as everyone knows from the headlines from 2016 election interference, all the way up until today where just last week we had uh, internet companies exposing a new uh, disinformation operation and European governments uh, attributing that information to, to a state actor. So it is creating many different types of geopolitical risk, both in terms of what happens inside countries and what happens between countries and their foreign relations. Uh, fascinating. Uh, of course, there's a long history and tradition of propaganda and disinformation. We can go back to Sun Tzu and deception or Machiavelli, but today, we're going to look at the contemporary uh, expression of this. We're going to examine this issue from a key few angles, the scope of the problem, its impact on democracy, and how to build a more resilient digital world. 
Before this live stream, we asked our audience on social media for their thoughts on some of the big questions we're taking on. One question we posed was, who bears the most responsibility for misinformation? The options were the people who create it, the internet platforms where people share it, or the people who consume it, meaning you and me, of course. And here are the results of our first audience poll. 54% said the people who created the content. 26% say the internet platforms, and only 20% said the consumers. In other words, surely not my fault, right? What do you think? Kevin, Jenny, a reaction? Well, I think, look, I think it's fair to say that we all, and by we all, I mean individuals, organizations, governments, bear some of the burden of this. Uh, it's challenging to say, you know, it's kind of a fun game to say who's most at blame, but we all have some blame. Sure, it, it does start with those who create it, with those who have the motives to, whether it's for financial gain or whether they're trying to create divisions, they absolutely have the majority of the blame. But what I'm interested in is what are we all going to do about it? And I know we're going to get there, um, but the blame game is important, but it's more important to define what we are going to do to respond to those who are creating that misinformation in the first place. Great. Well, that's a great jumping off point to our next guest who's written two highly informative books on disinformation. Uh, Nina Jankowitz is a Wilson Center Global Fellow and Director of External Engagement at Alipia Group, a company that combats disinformation. Nina, welcome. Thanks for having me. First, can you give us a sense of the, the scope of disinformation online and, and how vast is this problem, really? Well, you know, this is one of the biggest questions. It's really difficult to actually measure quantitatively how much disinformation there is. And that's in part because the social media companies, not all of them have been extremely forthcoming uh, with the data about how much they're taking down, what they're finding, what's being reported to them versus the content moderation decisions that they're making. And so researchers like me are forced to use open source data to kind of make inferences about this. But what I can say is that since uh, I've been studying this problem, so since 2015, 2016, and 2017, when I was living in Ukraine, watching the US election uh, from Kiev, it was a wild time to be in Ukraine, let me tell you that. Um, certainly, I think the scope of this problem has grown. We have moved from seeing foreign actors meddling in our elections to kind of a constant bombardment of our informational ecosystem, not just from foreign actors, but from homegrown disinformers as well. We've seen foreign actors turn to information laundering. Uh, we see disinformation for profit and disinformation for hire, in fact. So I think the scope of the problem is only growing because, unfortunately, we've been quite reticent to regulate this industry um, it, for, for good reason. You know, we want to protect freedom of expression, but our uh, our lack of movement in that area has created a bigger hole for us to patch up in the coming years. So the open society clearly has its enemies. Let's ask our viewers. We, we actually did. We asked our viewers who they thought was to blame, creators, social media platforms, or consumers. Now, I'm curious what your answer would be. Well, I think it's really difficult to, to kind of apportion that blame in some ways. I do agree with what Ginny said, that everybody to some extent is to blame. Yes, the creators of disinformation are to blame, but would it travel with the velocity and the amplification that it does if social media companies didn't have an incentive to have content that is enraging on their platforms. I like to say the most engaging content is the most enraging content. That's certainly what we heard from Francis Haugen last week in con Congress. But also, I'm a big proponent, and I'm, I'm sure we'll hear Yasmin and, and Rick talk about this later, of media literacy and information literacy. There are so many people who don't understand at this point why they're being served certain content and the fact that they are um, being manipulated, frankly, not only by the social media companies, but by those creators of disinformation. I think we all need to kind of collectively put our guard up and understand that we're the first line of defense to some of this stuff spreading. Now, both the WHO and the UN have recently called out the spread of misinformation as a key factor in COVID vaccine hesitancy. In May of this year, NPR reported the majority of lies and false information about COVID vaccines, up to two thirds of fake stories, were being published and promoted by just 12 individuals. Why is it so hard to stop them? 
Well, I think that has to do with the unique situation that the pandemic has provided. This is an extremely anxious time, an extremely fearful time, and people are looking for simple answers. That's usually why they seek out uh, conspiracy theories and disinformation. Some of these uh, narratives also provide community for people, and certainly we've all been lacking in that human connection lately. So I think that's part of it. Um, but it's also, you know, frankly, um, just something where people are being driven to this content by the algorithms on social media platform platforms. I did a story for the Atlantic uh, earlier last year during the reopen movement in around May or June of 2020, and. Uh, someone who went to my high school in New Jersey was reopening his gym purely for economic, not for political reasons. And by following that story and kind of researching it, I was put into anti-vax, uh, you know, QAnon and white supremacist content funnels on Facebook. So I think this can happen to anybody. Um, you just have to have your guard up. And frankly, we need a little bit more intervention, not only from the social media platforms who don't have the incentive to do this sort of thing, but uh, from regulators as well to protect public safety and public health. Well, I'm taking a note for myself, less going to the gym, more binging on Netflix. Thank you for that anecdote. <laughs> now, I want to bring Ginny and Kevin back in. Um, Kevin, the example uh, that was just shared is of individuals spreading disinformation. Can you break down state versus non-state actors in this issue? How are they different? Well, I think there's a, a kind of complex ecosystem at work here. You have at the very sort of high level, you have state actors, as I said, a, a smaller subset of nation states that invest in these kind of disinformation campaigns for, for foreign policy, geopolitical ends. Uh, it's all the usual suspects you could think of, Russia, China, for example, but also a few others. Uh, India, for example, has been a country where researchers at Oxford have identified and, and, and companies like Facebook and Twitter have, have attributed campaigns, information campaigns, to these governments trying to affect foreign policy. But the way that these governments actually try to do this is, is a little more complex. Some of them are, are run by uh, actual organs of the state, you know, uh, military intelligence, cyber actors. Others are outsourced uh, to, to private sector, effectively, companies, or some that kind of operate in the shadows between the private sector and the public sector. So again, depending on what the country in question that is sponsoring a disinformation campaign wants to accomplish, if it's undermining an, uh, an adversary country's faith in their own democratic processes, for example, that we've seen in, in 2016 and, and ongoing even today, uh, activity emanating from Russia, or whether it's more internal, you have this kind of ecosystem that has sprung up in which governments are either willing to, to provide the resources for their own internal cyber people, kind of as an extension of uh, cyber uh, methods to, to, to go and, and do these disinformation campaigns. And you've also got countries that are willing to pay, whether it's a troll farm that's just purely set up for disinformation, or even a, a PR PR type firm or marketing firm that's kind of willing to go there. Uh, we've seen a trend of some of these countries outsourcing these kinds of operations to developing countries where there's an English speaking population that can provide some of the content that fuels this. And then I think critically, you've seen, and I think that Virginia and Nina referenced this consumers of this information in the targeted countries picking up and carrying on these narratives. And so I think that this is a really complex problem to unravel. I think it was absolutely right to point out that you've got a problem of algorithms, you've got a problem of company policies, you've got a problem with public policy, and critically, you've got a problem of people who maybe have less faith in their institutions uh, being willing to consume and pass on this information and even start to contribute disinformation themselves into the ecosystem that starts to have political right. effects. Right. So, you know, we've, we've covered the ground on scope and sources of disinformation. Let's now turn to its impact on democracy in the U.S. and around the world. Nina Jankowicz is still with us and also joining us is Matt Masterson. He's a non-resident policy fellow at the Stanford Internet Observatory and he served as senior cybersecurity advisor at the Department of Homeland Security, where he focused on election security issues. Matt, I want to start with a quote from a recent Pew report on, disinforma on disinformation being the new normal in U.S. elections. The lies about election fraud, which range from false claims about the winner of the 2020 presidential race 
to accusations about this month's California recall process have state and local election officials worried about the future. As gubernatorial contests in New Jersey and Virginia approach this fall and next year's national midterms near, election officials are struggling to combat disinformation and assure voters their ballots are secure. Now, that's a pretty compelling and, and worrying quote. Give us a sense of the impact of disinformation on U.S. elections in your judgment. Yeah, and I appreciate the chance to be on uh, with these panelists, many of whom uh, we work so closely with uh, throughout 2020 to combat uh, mis and disinfo and respond uh, to the narratives that we saw across the United States. Uh, the challenge for election officials uh, is immense right now. Uh, in many ways, our response uh, to, to the 2016 election and Russian interference uh, was robust. Uh, the level of security improvements made by state and local election officials across the country uh, was immense. This was the most secure election that we've uh, ever had, the most audited election uh, that we've had. And yet, election officials sit there in an environment in which uh, the losers will not accept they lost. Frequently in election offices, the, the, the mantra is, uh, we need to convince the loser that they lost. What kind of transparency, uh, what kind of steps can we offer in order to convince the loser that they lost? And what we see now for many election officials is we need to assume that the loser will not accept they lost, uh, regardless uh, of margin of victory, uh, and offer a level of transparency, a level of evidence, a level of messaging uh, that allows voters to have the information that they need to turn to trusted sources like state and local election officials and others uh, to, to get the information they need uh, to, to accept the results of the election, even if there's an active campaign to undermine trust uh, by the loser of that election. And and it we're talking about 8,800 jurisdictions uh, that run mm -hmm. elections across this country. They're under-resourced, they're under-supported, uh, and it's going to take uh, all of us, private sector, academia, nonprofits, working hand in hand with them to, to really be the water and erode away at this distrust by offering the types of evidence uh, we have uh, to give voters trust in the election. Now, Matt, despite the proliferation of stories about widespread fraud in the 2020 U.S. presidential elections, it was officially declared the most secure in U.S. history. Now, what does that mean and how does Homeland Security track that? Yeah, it's a, a fantastic question. And, and that statement uh, that was released was released not just by uh, Homeland Security and CISA, but it was a combination of state and local election officials uh, and the private sector vendors that support elections in coordination with CISA and the EAC. So this wasn't uh, the federal government speaking on its own, but instead uh, state, local, uh, federal election officials in the private sector. And, and we were able to offer that assessment because we knew uh, the improvements that had been made. One. 95% or more of uh, votes cast in this last election were cast on auditable paper records, and we saw those records audited across the country. For instance, in Georgia, uh, where they hand count audited uh, every ballot cast in order to ensure the accuracy of the election. We saw in Maricopa County, uh, Arizona, where they have on the books a uh, requirement for hand count audits uh, of those paper records. Secondly, we had a level of insight and support both from the federal and state level down to the local level that we've never had before. So we had insights in the types of activities targeting election offices, the type of response and remediations. We had resilience uh, across these state and local offices. Uh, and I was sitting in Arlington, Virginia uh, on election day in our watch center with state and local uh, election official representatives in the private sector. And quite frankly, uh, it was quiet. Uh, and we were largely bored uh, because the election officials did such an incredible job building up resilience, building up uh, the, the backup plans to the backup plans to ensure that they could respond. And so we can just walk through the facts, uh, whether it's the number of Albert sensors deployed, the number of auditable paper records, uh, the amount of systems now behind multi-factor authentication, uh, the work uh, that the private sector, including Microsoft, did to secure uh, these systems that they support, uh, we know. But that doesn't mean that there isn't a lot more work to do. We know uh, that there's a lot more that we need to do to invest in our democracy and to support these officials so that they can provide the type of evidence voters need uh, in order to trust the process. Nina, in a recent article for a special edition of Foreign Policy, you wrote about specific measures that need to be taken to safeguard our elections from disinformation. One of those was greater accountability for people who knowingly spread that disinformation. Now, what does that mean in practice for individuals and governments? 
Well, I think that could look like a lot of things. And and frankly, um, as I mentioned before, we're pretty behind on regulation in this space. Um, not only has Congress not passed the Honest Ads Act, which is a bipartisan bill that would give more transparency to online ads uh, during elections about who paid for them and uh, how they were targeted, but we we also don't have a lot of accountability for candidates themselves um, and their campaigns in uh, the sort of campaigning that they do. I think you said at the beginning, you know, disinformation in politics has been around for a very long time, right? It's not going to go away, but I do think we need new rules of the road for the internet era. Maybe that is going to be a new federal regulator for the internet. Uh, maybe it's going to be parts of regulation taken care of by parts of different federal commissions, the FEC, the FTC, the FCC, that is yet to be determined. But I think it's clear that just like we have uh, rules for what you can say on TV, radio, and in print regarding election campaigns, I think we also need accountability in elections online. Um, and there's also you know, more to be explored in terms of uh, abuse and harassment that is being perpetrated online. My new book that's coming out in April looks at the effect of gendered disinformation on women in public life. And certainly there is not enough of a legal infrastructure that exists in the United States to support women and other marginalized communities who are being pushed out of public discussions online because we don't have anyone to go to, frankly. There's nothing in the legal infrastructure to support us there. So those are just some of the accountability measures that I think would be uh, important as we move forward. Great. Now, in fairness, Matt, uh, actually, that article was written by Matt. Uh, I should be proper <laughs> attribution. Uh, and in, uh, like in fairness as well, let me, let, me, let me give you a chance to uh, give your two cents, Matt, uh, since your uh, uh, excellent work served as a platform for others to discuss as well. But let me give you the opportunity. No, I, I appreciate that. And, and uh, you know, I agree largely with what Nina said. For, for me, it comes down to three things. The first is we need to invest uh, in our democracy. This is a national security issue, and we need investment not just from the federal government, though that's important, but from the federal, state, and local uh, together. Uh, and that doesn't just mean money. It, it means uh, IT professionals uh, being hired and assigned uh, to these state and local offices. There are many local election offices that have little or no IT support, and they're running critical infrastructure. And so we need to invest in them uh, and invest in, in support to them to, to manage the security of these systems, to allow them and empower them to go then talk to their voters about how the systems are secure, about the steps that they've taken. Two is we need to hold, and, and Nina touched on this, we need to hold those who are spreading this mis and disinformation about our democracy accountable. Uh, and we need to hold them accountable, whether that's at the ballot box, uh, whether that's financially. I mean, we have seen uh, with, with the uh, political review in Arizona and other places, this is a grift. This is an active attempt uh, to raise money and raise political profiles uh, by undermining democracy, and that needs to be exposed and held accountable. Uh, it can mean loss of law licenses or professional certifications, uh, but it needs to be exposed and held accountable, or the playbook will persist. The incentive structure will remain, and we'll just see more sophisticated attempts uh, to do exactly this. Uh, and then uh, the, the, the third uh, and final step uh, in, in uh, responding to this really needs to be uh, an ongoing engagement with voters about our democratic institutions and processes, uh, a push to really educate. We talked about civics education, but it really comes down to, yes, we have 50 states and 8,800 jurisdictions that run elections. They all kind of do it differently, but the process is transparent. The process is bipartisan, and these are professional election administrators administering elections, not just Johnny come latelys that show up one day and decide they're going to run election. And we need to stress to American voters that they can get their questions answered. We run it at the local level so that they can participate directly, and that's exactly what we need as we build into 2022 and 2024. Now, Kevin Ellison and Ginny Bedanes are still here. Uh, Kevin, give us a sense globally of the impact this information has had on democracy in recent elections. Well, I think that the trend that we saw with you know massively headline grabbing stories in 2016 around the US election and, and that we've seen continue in the West uh, with, with both the US 2020 elections and recent elections uh, in places like Germany, it's, it's, it's continued obviously, but, but in the emerging world, you've got uh, other, other issues that are bubbling up that maybe you don't see as much in, in the Western countries. You have a very personal impact of disinformation in places like India, for example, where messages spreading word of mouth between people in small communities on messaging apps lead to people being lynched or to mob violence. And so I think that is also a, a part of the disinformation problem. And you have uh, 
larger number of, of governments that you wouldn't think of typically having very sophisticated uh, malicious cyber capabilities that, uh, as I mentioned earlier, are kind of investing in this, these sort of disinformation capabilities to, to protect themselves, uh, to, to discredit opposition, to, to flood the information environment with misinformation. So I think you're going to you're seeing uh, the potential for these trends to lead to a more authoritarian or authoritarian leaning leaders finding new ways to entrench themselves in power. You know, back in the in the 2000s, the thinking was that these new social platforms would actually topple tyrants by giving people a means of organizing uh, in things like the Arab Spring, for example. And I think now what you've seen is is a kind of inversion of that. And you've got a fear now and, a, and, a, and I think a legitimate concern that it's actually going to help entrench uh, people who are in positions of power who can marshal this kind of computational propaganda to 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 keep their grip on their population. Uh, there's a great saying that you know Vladimir Putin in Russia doesn't care if what people are reading that the disinformation that Russia produces is true or not. If, if enough of it floods the information space, people don't know what to believe, and they become very cynical. And so I think that that's a a, a thing we need to safeguard against as well, both in uh, Western countries and critically in emerging markets. Now, Ginny, what role should private companies play in safeguarding elections? Sure. Look, as as Matt sort of indicated earlier, this is an all hands on deck kind of threat, um, and the private sector absolutely has uh, a responsibility, frankly, to be engaged and to be helpful. Um, one of the threats that we look at when we consider uh, threats to elections is sort of a hybrid threat whereby a cyber attack leads to access to information, which is then leaked or um, uh, put out into the public space at an opportune time and potentially mixed in with inaccurate information to create essentially a disinformation campaign that impacts the election itself. So at Microsoft, we focused on uh, providing cybersecurity support to organizations around elections. Uh, we have a program called Account Guard, which gives UB keys, which are security keys to folks in that space, including journalists. Uh, anyone who is really targeted by these kinds of campaigns. Um, and then there's a lot of technology solutions that are out there as well. One thing that we've also been focused on is essentially what can be done to identify the truth behind images and videos. Um, and we've been investing in something called media provenance that can help uh, identify whether an image or a doc or a, a video is authentic, whether it came from original source. So there's a lot that companies can be doing that the business sector can be doing. Um, we're trying to do our part, participate in, and engage with private sector, uh, part, uh, public sector as well. Um, but it's it's absolutely an area where companies should be doing more. Great, thank you. Uh, now let's take a look at another viewer poll. Uh, ahead of this live stream, we asked viewers, has social media on the whole been good for democracy or harmful for democracy? And here are the results. 28% said social media is good for democracy, and 72% said it's harmful. Who wants to weigh in on that? Matt, Ginny? Nina? Sure, yeah. well, I think the framework of that is probably uh, with the reflection of what we just saw occur in the US in 2020, uh, what we've seen in Europe. Um, but you know, you could certainly make the argument that there are areas where the access to social media has been helpful for um, democracies that are forming to the in initial stages of democracy. But it is hard to argue if you're looking at what we've all just gone through here in the US and of course what's continuing in other countries around the world to not see how there have been harms uh, that have come about as a result of uh, the infodemic, which is spread primarily on social media. Anyone else wanna weigh in on this? I would just add that, you know, I think we hear a lot from social media executives, the majority of the content that's spread on our platforms is, is positive. It's baby pictures, it's cat videos, everybody loves stuff like that. And that's true. Um, social media has also provided a platform for us all to connect during some of these very difficult times over the past couple of years. And we should err more toward that and not the, the negative stuff, not the harm that creates offline harms as well. And many of many of these instances are egged on and amplified by the affordances and infrastructures of the platform. So it's not black or white. I don't think we can say that it, social media is 100% bad for democracy or 100% good for democracy. But I hope that the platforms uh, will start to build products that are uh, more toward the positive side and less toward the money-making negative side in the future. Great. Um, 
Well, let me thank Matt Masterson and Nina Jankowicz. Thank you both for being here today. Our final discussion is going to be about what solutions to address these significant problems. What can tech companies, governments, and societies do about the infodemic? Rick Stengel served in the State Department during the Obama administration as Undersecretary for Public Diplomacy and Public Affairs. And Yasmin Green is the Director of Research and Development at Jigsaw, a unit within Google that explores threats to open societies. Welcome, both of you. Let me start with you, Rick. Yes, You've written extensively absolutely. about this topic, and you're also directly responsible for modernizing the, modernizing the U.S. approach to disinformation. Has this infodemic gotten worse in the years since? And if so, why? You know, I, I have to agree. Well, thanks, VJ. It's great to be here, and the um, panelists are all wonderful. I'm the, I'm the most amateurish of all of them. Um, I, I go back to what Nina said before. It's very hard to measure disinformation. And by the way, we've had this whole panel without actually ever defining the difference between disinformation and misinformation, uh, about which there is misinformation. <laughs> disinformation is, is deliberately false information designed to deceive people. Misinformation, and in my definition, is something that's just wrong, either deliberately or, or accidentally. And you know, I spent most of my career as a journalist. There's a lot of misinformation in journalism because people get things wrong, because human beings are fallible and they get things wrong. Um, so I can't measure how much disinformation there is. I can't even measure if there's more disinformation. I know this sounds crazy. The question is whether there's more disinformation as a percentage of information now than other times in history. I don't know the answer to that either. And I'd love to know if anybody else here does. But but yes, the short answer is uh, it's increasing, uh, in part because social media uh, shows there's no barrier to entry. Anybody, anybody can post anything. And, um, and I, we'll get to solutions in a second. But one of, the, one of the things to do is to, which I think everyone agrees with, is uh, reform Section 230 of the Communications and Decency Act to give the platforms more liability for what they publish, even though that, that legislation says that they're not publishers. So I've gone a little far afield now, um, and I'll let you get back to running this rigorous program. Very good. Well, I, I appreciate your um, uh, attention to our rigor, um, and also your, uh, I think, interesting mathematical formula you put on the table. We can't uh, we have to consider the volume of information which has exploded in, in recent years uh, before we can judge the percentage of misinformation and disinformation. So one has to weigh exactly. both the numerator and the denominator. Um, Yasmin, what do you think governments need to do to safeguard against disinformation, using my word carefully here, from both state and non-state sources? Oh, what is interesting, the, the role of, we can, be very um, inward looking in the US where Rick, Rick and I are based and, and talk about what the government can do um, to help tech companies be better at um, moderating or tackling the misinformation challenge. Um, and of course, regulation is the, the key one. Um, we can also look kind of beyond the US and look at the many um, countries around the world. I think it was a uh, Kevin who was talking about many of these where governments are actually the perpetrators of you know, disinformation, um, not only by kind of co-opting media and themselves, the, the government spokespeople being propagators, but also by coercing platforms or attempting to coerce platforms to censor information on their behalf so that they can achieve their own domestic election meddling. So I think there's an interesting role for governments to play to come together, actually, democratic governments and contemplate what an, you know, an affirmative uh, manifesto would look like for a free and open internet around the world and, and try to really push back against repressive governments. And, you know, there are, there are autocracies like Iran, for example, who, you know, as soon as the internet became available, it was apparent that it would be a, a helpful tool to, uh, to kind of reinforce their authoritarianism. But then there are many countries around the world that are really looking at the, the open governance, you know, open internet model and the internet governance model of the West and looking at the internet governance model of autocracies and thinking about what would suit them best. Um, so I think it's an important time for actually, you know, the democracies around the world to, to come together and help steer this globally in, in, a, in the right direction. So you've talked about the role of governments, particularly 
uh, democracies. What do you see as the role and responsibility of big tech here? To help keep people safe? Um, sure, I, like, you know, echoing the kind of lots of responsibility to, to go around. I've been working at, uh, at Google, which is where Jigsaw is based, for 15 years. And I, so I've definitely been on a journey of um, imagining what our responsibility is. And admittedly, when I started at Google, I had a much more pacifist idea of aspiring to be a platform where, you know, more speech can drown out you know, bad speech, and it was it was much more permissive. And the you know the the threats that we're seeing today felt very remote, um, and that's just not the case now. So you know, I think the responsibility is is um, is acute, um, and you know we're on a journey to do more. So I, I um we were talking before about cybersecurity as a you know is is misinformation a cybersecurity threat? And I was reminded that when phishing kind of we understood social engineering and phishing, the idea that you would try and get somebody's personal information um, from them by, mm -hmm. by, by, by presenting yourself as a trustworthy source or as a known relation, um, and that you might be able to get access to you know, systems by kind of extracting password information, et cetera. That just seemed so soft, like a mm -hmm. soft cyber threat in a way that we took a while to kind of recognize the gravity of that threat and to, to firmly characterize that as a cybersecurity threat. Um, and I think we are, that's the reckoning that's happening now with mis and disinformation. You know, maybe pre-2016, this kind of inauthentic or coordinated campaigning online um, to disinform people, we kind of hadn't really understood the, 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 you know, the threat to critical infrastructure that that could pose. And we're now learning and iterating on, um, on measures to, to tackle it. Rick, can you weigh in on the role of big tech here and what more needs to be done in, in stepping up the way that uh, Yasmin has outlined her own evolution of views? Yes, I'm happy to do that. Uh, but first, I just also want to say that I'm a skeptic about how much the governments can do. Uh, having been in government, uh, living in the United States where we're protected by the First Amendment, the very idea that government would be in the information regulation business is a dangerous one. And uh, I think it's Dangerous too, because a lot of the people who are are the who speak to the dis who are disinformationists who speak to people who are skeptical of government uh, would regard this as a as an infringement of their rights and, an, and a basic uh, infringement of, of of the constitution. So I think I think governments have to be careful. And remember, the First Amendment. And this I'm going to segue now to the private sector. The First Amendment actually applies only to government. Congress shall make no law. The first five words of, of the First Amendment, uh, it, that doesn't apply to the private sector. That doesn't apply to Google. That doesn't apply to Microsoft. That doesn't apply to uh, Twitter. Um, the difference, though, now is that those companies have become the public square. Uh, and so now they have a higher responsibility, I would say, uh, to regulate their own public spaces. I mean, the, the definition of the First Amendment now and, what, and free speech is determined by Facebook. Uh, not by the United States, or not even by the Supreme Court. So I actually think that the that all of the platform companies, I talked about reforming Section 230, all have to have more liability for what they for the content on their platforms. Now, Section 230 says they're not publishers. Well, not only are they publishers, they're by far the biggest publishers in the history of the world by an exponential margin, uh, and that makes it seem hard. Well, how can we how can we edit? All the stuff on our platform, it's by it's by non-professional people. I'm not asking that everyone to edit everything the way edited, you know, I used to be editor of Time Magazine, where everything in Time Magazine is edited. But where there's content that uh, that is disinformation, hate speech, uh, uh, speech that is racist or sexist, uh, speech that indirectly leads to violence, uh, all of those things that platform companies have to have liability for it. And that law, the Section 230 law, which was written, you know, when MySpace was big, uh, it ha has to be updated. And, and there is a weird consensus between left and right uh, to, to amend Section 230. Each side wants to do that for a different reason. But I do think that um, giving, making the platform companies and the tech companies more liable for their content that is on their platforms is is the way to go. It's better than than any government regulation, and um, 
there have been lots of ways to do that. I mean, Nina mentioned the Honest Ads Act. That's just one thing. But having much greater transparency uh, is, is one of the places to start. Great. Well, that, that's certainly a very uh, a clear argument. Um, I want to turn to a recent conversation that uh, Eurasia Group and G Zero Media President Ian Bremmer had with uh, Kai Fu Li, who's an AI expert based in Beijing and a venture capitalist. Here's what he had to say about possible regulation and further oversight of social media companies like Facebook. Now, there would need to be certain things established as things that are unacceptable, uh, things like knowingly creating a system that is biased or uh, knowingly allowing too large a percentage of fake news or deep fake. Uh, just as examples, I think these would have, we have to come up with these. And, and another related idea is there could be a uh, third party watchdog that publishes on a monthly basis how companies do on these metrics and does standardized tests on them. And the ones that don't do well are shamed and they lose their, their brand loses value. So Yasmin, what do you think about that idea of a third party entity with oversight of data? Or well, maybe, yeah, I, I think that the, the vehicle for making data public is is key and that's actually the the nut that we have yet to crack is is how do we share meaningful data with external researchers there have been some high profile cases of data being shared by major platforms but ultimately being i mean barely useful to to researchers because it had been scrubbed you know mm -hmm. some wednesday and, and kind of wasn't you know instructive um so we have to figure that out but i think you know kaifu these a legend and, and and Rick was also a legend. You know, like they they actually like saying the same thing with respect to transparency. Um, you know, what we need, you know, I think in all the sectors, certainly in tech, is we need rules and we need tools and we need accountability. And the good news is we kind of have the rules and the tools in the tech sector. We have extensive policies that describe what is and isn't uh, permissible. And then we have these algorithms that can go and find this stuff and you know you know assist with removing it and or demoting it. Um, that's a really sophisticated operation that I've watched get more and more sophisticated every year. Um, we need now the accountability part, and uh, you know, and that is inviting researchers in to look under the bonnet and um, a help with their um, their brilliant thinking from a different vantage point, and and also you know check our homework so that it's not us checking our own homework, um, and that's going to be uncomfortable, you know. But if but we are headed in one direction towards regulation and for the regulation to be well-founded, we need researchers to understand what's happening. Um, and so we need to break through break, break through that with discomfort. I'll, I'll just share a, an experience that we've had at Jigsaw, my group where, which really ties to what Kai Fili was saying. We have a, um, a an, we've developed some, some models, machine learning models that, that help people with comment sections and public publishers with comment sections identify hate and harassment. Um, and the idea is that the automated tools scan all the comments, rank in, in, in order of toxicity, and then the human reviewers can have an easier time of deciding what does and doesn't stay, because it's such an enormous task to keep comment sections kind of productive and, and healthy. Um, so we, I think it's one of the leading, um, you know, kind of APIs, these, you know, the, that's the way that we, we allow others to access our tech. It's one of the leading APIs for, for toxicity detection out there. And we also let researchers study it you know, use it. So we have like, I don't know, 100 papers about perspective, the, the, the API is called perspective, most of which are critical, even though it's one of the leading, you know, publicly available uh, tools for this, they're mostly critical, because as good as the technology is, it's also biased. And we've been open from the beginning about seeing our bias, trying to measure it, trying to rectify it, and we've made improvements, and it's still flawed. But and that's uncomfortable to you know that's the kind of we need the the discomfort of you know having the spotlight on all of the shortcomings in order for us to improve our product and for people to feel that it's inside and outside of the company that this is an inclusive kind of genuine you know process that we're on to build better and better tech. So I mean that's very consistent with with I think what Kaifeli was talking about in terms of uh, bias and how we might try to mitigate it. Uh, you talked about tools and rules. Uh, I, I would add social norms. I think those are the three really helpful uh, ways of changing behavior. We've yet to develop the social norms for this evolving technology forum. Now, Rick, um, uh, just a quick take from you. You talked about the role of 
trading platforms as publishers. But when you look at the question of regulation of social media writ large, what would be your top priorities? How do you frame that question? My, my top priority would be to give them similar liabilities to what traditional publishers have. Uh, Nina also mentioned, for example, the laws that already exist uh, regarding elections on in print, on radio, on TV. It just seems absurd that we don't have that kind of uh, regulation for um, internet and and platforms. I mean, if if the regulation began to interfere with the business model of the platforms, if they didn't they didn't take off this noxious content, which 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 we all you know pretty much agreed on, uh, they they could be sued the way a traditional publisher could be. Um, I think people would have a lot more alacrity in taking it off. I do like the idea that was just mentioned about a, about third party actors uh, and trying to measure what's on the platforms. I, I'm on the board of a company called NewsGuard, uh, which is one of these companies now that is kind of gives a good housekeeping seal of approval or thumbs up or thumbs down to uh, to publishers, uh, uh, sites uh, and evaluates content. I mean, it's kind of impossible right now to evaluate every story. Um, but if, if somebody gets a good, good housekeeping seal of approval, then people can by and large trust their content. And, um, it's a hard problem. I mean, um, uh, Yasmin was talking about algorithms and I mean, somebody once said to me, well, why don't we just have an algorithm that biases all content towards truth and an algorithm that biases against falsehood? Well, that would be a great and wonderful idea. Uh, but the problem is, in the history of civilization, we've never been able to do that. <laughs> right. Um, well, Kevin and Ginny are still with us. Uh, let me turn to Kevin. Uh, Kevin, we've talked a little bit about artificial intelligence. Kai Fu Lee, of course, is a, a great proponent and expert on that topic. Um, do you think uh, systems that mimic human speech or create fake videos are the game changers here? Uh, is that the real issue that we need to be worried about? I definitely think that that AI driven propaganda or AI driven disinformation is going to be a, a, a major challenge. I, I view it as a kind of extension of this 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 problem that we've already identified rather than as a complete game changer, Par partly because I think that you can fool people once with a deep fake video, but I don't think you can fool them over and over again. W what may end up happening if deep fakes, for example, you know, fake videos that are that use AI to make it look like people are saying things they never said or doing things they never did, if that technology becomes widely deployed and, and a sort of daily part of, of disinformation around the internet, I just think that it will encourage people to kind of turn off uh, all the more. Uh, and so I think that's that's the real fundamental challenge from, from that kind of use of AI. Um, I, I wanted to go back to what some of the earlier guests were talking about I think that one of the really interesting things here is trying to think through as you develop tools and as, as companies and governments look at developing policies and even this idea of third parties to try to address some of these problems. I really think that going back to what Matt was saying about how CISA and other people running the US elections really tried to show their work and really tried to establish resilient systems, I really think the issue going forward for internet platforms is about how can they establish some legitimacy around the policies and tools that they're using? In a sense, you don't want just individual companies deciding what their policy is for, for leaving up or taking down content. But you also don't just want governments to do that either, because a corrupt government could use that power towards the, their own ends, not necessarily in the interests of democracy. And so I think that this idea of third parties is a really interesting one that people should explore as part of a solution here. Uh, you they look at lawyers and how they police themselves as an industry through bar associations, which can disbar people who behave in ways that go against the legal profession. I think that there's an underdeveloped discussion of how uh, tech platforms and governments might be able to collaborate in thinking up ways that more innovative types of third parties that might have some kind of quasi judicial or oversight role over the industry might be able to help shore up legitimacy and really show, look, it's not just our company created kind of oversight body that's making a decision and saying that that what we did is right or wrong. There's actually a, a bigger group here. And I also think the final thing I wanted to say about that, and I think this goes down to the level of, of AI issues as well, 
the problems go deeper than just content. They go down to the design of algorithms and systems. Uh, one of the biggest things that happened in the wake of the January 6th Capitol riots, for example, wasn't just that uh, the accounts of President Trump and other people who were questioning the, the legitimacy of the election or, or encouraging the people who were rioting at the Capitol building were, were deplatformed, but actually mm -hmm. one of the rival sites was disappeared from the internet because companies stopped providing web hosting services. So I think that we need to have a, a much bigger conversation about that and then assign specific responsibilities to companies, to regulators, and to third parties to, to check people's work at, in order to provide that same kind of uh, showing the work and really shoring up the understanding of and, and perceived legitimacy of the process that Matt was talking about with regard to the 2020 elections. Well, that's actually a good jumping off point. Um, we have one final viewer poll. P0 asked followers on social media, were internet companies right to ban or suspend Donald Trump's social media accounts after the January 6th insurrection at the US Capitol? Yes or no? Very clear demarcation on uh, the question. And the answers were also fairly uh, robust uh, in their uh, results. You can see 72% said yes, social media companies were right to ban or suspend Trump and 28% said no. Um, a quick reaction from anyone on my panel who wants to jump in? Well, I, I saw I saw that uh, that question, and one of the the followers um, following accounts commented, "If you want to get a broader perspective or a different perspective, you know, you should post that question rather than here on Twitter." On I can't remember what it was, like one of the mm -hmm. chans or one of the you know chat forums online, where maybe you you might have a different you know a different subset of the population who might have different opinions to that, um, and that, that actually connects really well with with uh, you know something that that. Um, Kevin alluded to, which is when, you know, one of the, when, when people say to me, well, well, what's the big, what's the next big technological threat around disinformation? So we had deep fakes and we were a little hysterical about that. And we have AI, gen, you know, chatbots that are going to be so sophisticated and, you know, what comes next? And I say that when I look forward, actually, the thing that I, I think is, is a major emerging issue that we need to grapple with is that as the major platforms prosecute more and more content and individuals and um, apps uh, for violating their, their policies on hate and misinformation, this stuff doesn't evaporate. It is not the case that, uh, you know, that people stop wanting to, you know, plot or, or uh, um, ally around hateful topics. Um, so this stuff goes to alternative platforms and eventually those alternative platforms will you know exceed the tipping point whereby they become destinations so people come to the major platforms for you know a more curated you know experience right. some more awesome stuff and then they're, they're going elsewhere and and so that i mean there are some implications of that for us but i, I think we have to keep in mind that the online ecosystem is vast and the the major platforms have absolutely have to keep their users safe and, and enforce and, and be accountable. Uh, but we have to think about maybe some of the unintended consequences of that and think early about how we might mitigate some of those harms. Well, that really expands the technological conversation to a societal one. That Let me turn to Rick on this. Um, what are your thoughts on the role that this information plays in the societal psyche? Why are people so drawn to it? And, and how do you combat that? Well, I'm a big fan of... Um, Daniel Kahneman, uh, I think everybody should read Thinking Fast and Slow. Uh, and he's sort of the, the, the founder of this idea of confirmation bias, which is that we are attracted to the information we already agree with and we're not receptive to the information that we don't. And, you know, confirmation is, bias has been around since, you know, uh, Satan told Eve not to take a bite out of the apple. Um, and and so part of the problem, and now I'm really getting metaphysical, but part of the problem is that uh, technology is evolving much faster than human beings are. And so the, and so the technology can, can use all of these things that make us human, uh, you know, our, our willingness to believe lies, the fact that, that uh, uh, disinformation or uh, strange theories flourish when people feel insecure, uh, the technology can can enhance all of those things. That's why we're in this kind of uh, vicious circle. Uh, but but the problems are you know go back to 
you know, us as human beings. And um, and I think the solutions have to have to have to work that that way, too. Um, so I'm sorry that that's not a very fulfilling answer, but um, but. That is the reality. Well, I, I think you, 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 in a sense, you, you sum up the nature of our own evolution. We're we're we get to figure it out. Um, now, uh, mindful of time, I want to uh, uh, think about how we conclude our, our fascinating uh, tour of the horizon today. I want to give Ginny and Kevin a chance to share some brief takeaways from what we've heard over this hour. Maybe uh, Ginny, I'll give you the first crack. Uh, what's your main takeaway from this? Sure. Thanks. Well, uh, I, you know, having a conversation like this is is always going to be a little on the depressing side, right? When we're talking about all the threats that we face, the challenges, the obstacles, it's you know, obviously, it's not easy to solve. If it was easy, it would have already been solved, or this or this conversation would have been a lot shorter. Um, but the takeaways that I have is that there are a lot of people who care a lot about this problem who are working collaboratively, um, which may sound obvious, but was not the case four or five years ago. We've really seen um, the private sector step up. We've seen the public sector, civil society. Folks are really coming together to identify solutions and put them into action and test things out and see what works. Um, so I, mostly I'm going to end on a positive note that I think that we are moving in the right direction. We've identified some ways that we can start to tackle this. And again, disinformation is never going away, but I do think that we can collectively work to mitigate it. Great. Uh, thank you. Kevin, let me give you uh, the last word on the summary today. Well, I think that, that Ginny's point she just made, disinformation isn't going away, is a crucial step to effectively addressing the problem. I don't think we should be talking about solving the problem because I, I don't think that human nature is going away. I, don't, I think the internet will evolve, but it's not going away. And I think that the, the viral sort of zero cost transmission of information that the internet enables is a new thing in society and geopolitics that we're all still adapting to. Bad actors will find ways to adapt to, to things that companies and governments do to try to solve the problem. So I think we really need to think about it as more of a kind of managing and mitigating these problems with everyone working together on different parts of it. And so the positive news that I take out of today is that we're starting to see this. We're starting to see really intelligent conversations about the problem th that are looking at there's not one actor to blame. It's, it's the evolution of technology and the way that society works and the way that companies respond to incentives and so on. There's a solution that involves regulation, but there's also solutions that involve technological fixes and shoring up the foundations of, of democratic institutions, making voters care that if politicians lie to them and try to manipulate them through social media, they shouldn't vote for them. Uh, these will all take a long time, but I think we have a much better understanding today, for instance, compared with 2016, uh, of the problem and of the ways that bad actors are trying to manipulate people. So there's a lot of hope in that, that going forward that we can come up with intelligent solutions uh, and then continually refine the process of how we address this problem as these bad actors adapt their strategies. Well, I, I applaud you both for heroically clutching uh, notes of optimism from our depths of despair into which we sunk during this hour. Uh, you've given us some very powerful <laughs> insights, as indeed have all of you. I want to thank uh, Ginny Bedanes, Kevin Allison, Yasmin Green, and Rick Stengel. Thank you very much for joining us. G Zero will be bringing you live programming throughout the year from some of the world's most important political and diplomatic gatherings. Up next, COP26 is set to be one of the most critical gatherings of leaders and influencers on climate change. G Zero will bring you coverage of the event and a special live stream presentation on Tuesday, November 2nd, beginning at 11 a.m. Eastern Time. You can learn more about that event as well as uh, uh, others at g0media.com slash global stage. I'm BJ Vaidiswaran, and for all of us, I'd like to thank you for watching. See you again soon. <laughs>